You've heard it in church at least four Sundays a year. Sometimes they will take it even further all the way to Epiphany, so you have two more Sundays. And then, if they make it to a television show, all the television shows during December, and sometimes November, about Christmas. So we got the story down right. Do we? Do we know the story? Do we know all of the story? I'm no super scholar, so I can't say I have found things in the Bible which have, you have all missed. <laughs> but I want us to take a look at the story again and let God tell you his story. When we think of the gospel story, we see varying accounts. We have, for example, Matthew and Luke. We'll go into greater detail, but some things Matthew mentions, but Luke doesn't. And vice versa. Why, if we have this one event, but different stories? There may be various reasons, but there are at least two I want to point out this morning. One is point of view. From where they were at that point in time. For example, if an accident occurred right out here as soon as we walked outside this building this morning, none of you, because I know you're all perfect drivers, but out here, and we saw all the stuff, and we all had to give a written testimony to the cop. I think I saw one thing, Keith saw another, Phil saw another, and the only who knows everything saw correctly. <laughs> But it's because maybe we were standing at different angles. Or we were distracted for part of it. We don't know, but we give what we saw. Nothing was lied about, but we have different stories in the minor details. The majors are the same. The minors, there might be some variants. So that is one reason why Matthew and Luke and some of the other stories differ. The second is who the author was writing to. Who were they hoping to get this message across that Christ had come for them? Therefore, they tailor the story, their account, to what they know will attract their readers. They're not adjusting it are tweaking the story, they're just highlighting the points that will draw the reader's attention. For example, Matthew wrote to tell the story that Jesus was of the line of David, the king of kings who came to rescue his people. He's got a Jewish audience, so he's making sure he backs everything up with scripture from the Old Testament. He points out the lineage of David all the way, well, actually back to Abraham, to Jesus. He is verifying that everything that this Jewish audience needs to know about Jesus, they're getting. Luke, on the other hand, is speaking more to a Gentile population. They don't need to know about the ancestry, but they need to know that they are accepted. So, for example, at the end, what some might say is a post-nativity story, when Jesus is taken to the temple to be circumcised, Simeon speaks up that all nations will be brought under him. Now, it's not that Matthew forgot some of the Gentiles. That's because who came to visit the baby when it was supposedly a Jewish background? It was wise men from a different country. Foreigners, Gentiles came. So Matthew incorporated, even though he spoke mostly to Jews. And Luke did address some of the issues for the Jewish congregation, even though he was mostly speaking to Gentiles. So that is why we have these two different accounts, but we have more than that. Because not only do we have the audiences and their perspectives, but they also want to give a person in the story's point of view. 
Going back to Matthew, he actually said he was a Jewish, uh, his audience was Jewish, but he was also telling the story from Joseph's perspective. How much do we really hear of Mary in Matthew? Mm. Except that she was the spouse of Mary and Joseph and gave birth to Bethlehem. It's mostly about Joseph is being ready to divorce her privately, gets the vision, then they go to Jerusalem, have a baby, and then they have more visions because Herod's out to kill a baby. It's mostly about Joseph and his point of view. Then you have Luke, and he goes, well, there's more than just Joseph and the baby there. Mary has her story. So let's hear what the mother of the child has to say. Well, she adds in elements like Zechariah and Elizabeth because they were her cousins. She can tell about John the Baptist. And as a mother who is intent upon that first child in her life, she is aware of everything going on that night. Joseph is like, he's out there pacing in front of that state. But Mary is capturing everything. She remembers the shepherds. She remembers there was no room in the inn. And you know Joseph heard that every time. <laughs> there was a reservation. But it was that idea that she remembered. And she told. She told about going eight days later and bringing Jesus to the temple to be circumcised. And Simeon and Anna give their blessings and prophecies about this little baby. So we have these two stories. And over time, as we have heard them, they have merged into one. Because they are the same story, just different views. And because of that, we have a grander picture than if we had just heard one. But ladies and gentlemen, that is not the only time the nativity, the birth of Christ, is mentioned in the New Testament. Of course, you have plenty of scriptures in the Old Testament prophesying about that future event. But the New Testament is it just the gospel writers, these two gospel writers? And the answer is thoroughly no. In Colossians 1, in two verses, it talks about, verse 15 and 16, that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. This is the idea, maybe more of a divine perspective than an earthly one, but who he was before he came and how he brought that with him. The image of God brought before us. Well, how do you work that out? Well, Paul, somewhat, Clears that up again in Galatians 4, 4 through 5. That God sent his son, born of a woman, bringing the divine to earth, putting flesh upon that spoken word. So we're getting bits and pieces here. Another one which comes out really. I guess the best way descriptive, but it's also symbol symbolism, is in Revelation 12. Where you have the woman about ready to give birth, and the dragon is there ready to smash the baby as soon as it is born. But the Lord whisked that baby up to heaven to set him on his throne. It doesn't say Jesus, but we all know who sits on that throne. <coughs> We don't really go to Revelation for the Christmas story because unless you already know Jesus, it's hard for the world to recognize this serpent, or we just drag in this woman and this baby. But as believers who have studied the rest of the Old and New Testament, we recognize who they were. So you have the nativity even in Revelation. Then another one, one which I love, is found in Philippians. Philippians 2. 
is actually, I believe, at one time, one of the first hymns of the church. It's talking about what attitude we should have as believers. In Philippians 2, and we'll begin with verse 6. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Here comes the nativity. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. We now go to Easter. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Christmas and Easter in one verse. We see God emptying himself. All that glory, all that is due unto him. Say, I pass it. I got a job to do. I love this verse, but the one thing which I miss is why? Why would God give everything up? Come to earth and then later die on the cross. That comes to our last account of nativity. It is from the divine perspective. John 1. Mary had her choice, her chances to tell her side. Joseph had his chance to tell his side of the story. It is now God's chance. He's saying, now let me tell you why it's all here. I made mankind. Both me and my son, he was with me all the time. He was the word which I spoke, which made you. There is nothing outside of this that you that exists that he did not create. But then we fell. <coughs> fell because of sin. We chose to disobey. He gave us the option, but with that option there came responsibility. And we choose to envy God instead of love Him. By doing so, we reaped what we sowed. Our sin brought our own death and separation from God. And but yet God, God, Dare I say it? Yes. He loved us! That is the reason why the nativity takes place. Not of obligation. Not just because he felt like it on a whim. Oh, let's do something different today. Let's be born a man. No. He came because he loved. How do I know? Those three boys who just went back, they know. Because I've seen them in Sunday school and Hawaii, they know the one verse which tells it all. John 3, 16. For God so loved that he gave his only son. God loved. Jesus loved that he gave himself that we might have everlasting life and not perish. It was all due to love. Love which has brought us together. Love is what binds us. But yet in that love, it was not fully conceived. He came to his own, but his own did not accept him. Now some could say, well, that's the Jews. That's every human being. Right. It is only when we allow the Spirit to talk with us that we learn the truth. That we then find that love. And then we who do find the love we are told according to John become children of the Most High. I'm proud to be called the Son of Elvis Christ. Even though a lot of people have a hard time understanding what his name actually is. But I'm more proud to be called the Son of the Most High. The Son of God. To be considered I told him that I could, I know how much my physical dad loved me. But my dad didn't send my older brother to die for me. God did. And my older brother was willing to do it. 
That is love. Even though it wasn't fully received by every single one, he still loved enough to do it. And then he encourages us, commands us, to do the same. Love without respect, expecting to receive anything in return. I don't just shower Lord Boston's way by taking him out for a meal, expecting him to get treat me with a new pizza next time I call the pizza shop. He'll get in trouble if he does that, one thing. But the idea is, I don't expect it, I do it just because I care. I don't want to pat him back because everyone's mad and that doesn't cost enough for lunch, which I did too, I think. I owe you one now. <laughs> but it's the idea of just being concerned. Not expecting anything in return. And it's not just the people who I like. But according to Luke, to Luke 6.35. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Your reward will be great. And you will be sons again of the Most High. Because he did the same. Showed the same kindness to the ungrateful and the wicked. We are the ungrateful and the wicked. And Jesus showed that love to us. We were his enemy. We spat in his face. We drove those nails in his hands and feet. We crammed that crown of thorns on his head. But he loved us just the same. So now we are called to not only love those who love us or put up with us, but to love all. <clears throat> not expecting anything in return just to let them know that we love them. Hopefully in that time we can be like Margaret here and show them not only our love, but the love of the Father. And how much more he has to offer them. We are not the light. John the Baptist was not the light, but neither are we. But we are a testimony of the light. And the way we do that is by following the example of love. It's not fancy words. It's not great acts of philanthropy. It's loving. Truly loving from our heart. Even if your emotions aren't behind it. But if you choose to show an act of love upon someone, it is love. I may not feel like in the mood, but if I wake up in the morning, I thought, I'm going to show some love to my wife by having her cup of coffee waiting for her. Even though I'm running late, I still show her that act of kindness, that act of love. All right, now I just got your cup of <laughs> And now all your wives are now expecting you to coffee waiting for them in the morning. But, don't worry, I don't do it yet. But that is that whole idea that we need to be willing to share. Even of the most humblest of attacks, actions, and loving. Again, not only to those we love, but to all and not expecting anything in return. Jesus was hoping there would be a return of love, but that's the only thing he ever expected. He wasn't expecting a pat on the back. He wasn't expecting shouts of praise to Jesus. He gives that anyway for who he is. Not for what he did. The only thing he wants is our love. And he isn't going to force himself on us. He loved himself, he, he loved us so unconditionally that even if we didn't give back, he just wanted us to know that he loved us. That we, that he loved, he loved us. 
this Christmas, this, this holiday, we talk about the coming of Christ, the light of it, the joy of it, the peace of the times. But this holiday is more importantly about the Lord. God's love for us. It even outdoes Valentine. The holiday dedicated to love. Christmas beats Valentine's hands down. So let this Christmas and every day before and after be a season of love. Share the love because you have come to know that this Jesus, this Son of God, left heaven above, not expecting anything except to shower you with his love. He came born in a stinking stable for you. Because you know it was a claim. He not only born in a stable, he went to a cross and died as a thief, even though he was innocent for you. That is love. That is love. Amen. Are you showing that love? Are you living that love? I pray that you are. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do just want to share the love because we know what love is. We don't want to just go out and have the knowledge of our Savior Jesus Christ and how he came. This is wonderful news, but if it doesn't sink into our heart because we don't feel your love for shame on us. Open our hearts so that we may feel your love and then shower it upon others with no expectation. Dear Lord, let us love. Teach us to love like you love. In all this we pray. Amen. If you do not know this baby in an infant, I encourage you at this time as we get ready to sing our closing song.